Good morning, everyone. How are you today? Did you guys have a great Christmas? Yeah, we did. We had a wonderful time. Did it snow at anyone's place? No. Did not. I know. Yay! Praise the Lord. That's awesome. Oh, that's so good. Couldn't have planned that better. Well, I'm so glad that you guys are here today and just ready to worship. Let's stand together. Let's give our, our hearts to the Lord right now and pray together before we begin. Lord Jesus, thank you for a Sunday that we get to sing to you, to offer up our prayers to you as a community, to be together and know your goodness, your faithfulness. And Lord, we trust you for all of the things that are going on in each one of our lives, our homes, our families, to know that you are the God that is over all, that you are involved in our lives, you care. And that's why we come together and praise you and give you glory today, because you're worthy of it. All the praise we can give you, Lord, you are worthy. So today, as we lift up our hearts to you and, and trust you, we ask that you speak to us, remind us of your truth, that you have a purpose for each one of us, that you're always working in our lives. We just thank you, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. Amen.
even when we don't see it. Even when I don't see it, you work. Even when I don't see that you work it, never stop, never stop working. Your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing of the goodness Good. 
continue to pray for a moment. Let's, let's do that together. Lord, just to think about your goodness this last year. I know each one of us may have had challenges, ups and downs, all the things that we go through. But through all of it, you have been faithful, just like the words we sing. Through all of it, you have been involved. And there's no end to your goodness. And looking into this next year, Lord, we believe that you will continue to be faithful. You are the one who always was, and you are, and you are yet to come. There's no shadow of doubt that you are the Savior. You are the fixer and the builder and the lover of our heart. We praise you for those characteristics, Jesus.
promise stands. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail. Oh, your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Wasn't I? 
mother in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the waters Holding back the sea Should I ever be reminded Of how I've been set free There is a cross that bears the burden Here another died for me
church. Cause I know that's where you'll be. The joy from every battle. Yes, I know that's where you'll be. Yes, you will. Count the joy from every battle. Because I know that's where. Let's do one more. I count the joy. I count the joy from every battle. Cause I know that's where you'll be. week from New Hope, they sent one of their pastors, Tim Manzer. This week, Buckley Tabernacle, down there in Buckley, has sent their pastor, John Vermilia. So come on up, John. He's going to preach to us today. Is this cool? Oh, what? Thanks, Andy. I don't know about cool, but uh, <laughs> when I grow up, I want to be like that guy. <laughs> that silky bass coming out of the worship leader. Well played, sir. Uh, yeah, why not? So, um, my name is John. I'm one of the pastors at the uh, Tabernacle, um, and I bring you greetings. I know that's old school, uh, but I bring you greetings uh, from men and women and students at our campus, both in Buckley and our campus in Manistee. And uh, uh, I've been asked to tell you that we love you and will continue to love you, and we've been praying for you specifically. Uh, we love Westside Church. If you have a Bible, I know most people don't carry them these days, but if you have a Bible or a device, I encourage you to turn to Matthew chapter 16. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's okay. I believe we'll put the words up on the screen. And I want to read for you some familiar words. It's a familiar little story from the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Jesus has been teaching for a while, and his disciples have seen his miracles. They've heard him talk about the kingdom. Some of them are daring to believe that maybe he's the promised one. Maybe he's the Messiah. And this is a pivotal moment that's recorded in Matthew 16. And I just want to read one part from it and then just offer a few thoughts. And I hope they're an encouragement for you today and maybe even a challenge. Starting in verse 13 of Matthew 16, I'm reading from the ESV. It says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples, to tell no one that he was the Christ. This is God's word. And this is a good word for us. And for those of us that have been around the church ghetto for more than a minute, we may have heard this story. And for those of us that are a little bit new to it, that's okay. We're going to break a couple things down. And then I want to get to two things that Jesus said. But I think because we're in this passage, it's important for us to look at his first question. He says, who do people say that I am? He's starting a conversation with his disciples. Now, these guys, as I mentioned, have been with him for almost three years. And they've kind of latched on to him because of what he's doing, the way he teaches, who he is. They've seen him uh, on stage. They've seen him behind the scenes. These guys know him pretty intimately, but he still asks them the question, who do people say that I am? And their response comes from uh, directly from what the voices in the crowd are saying. Well, some say you're like a prophet. 
one of these guys from back in the day, right? And they start listing these guys. And then Jesus asks a second question that we all have to answer. And the question is, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And so I don't want to just rush past that because uh, that's important. Just because you're in a church, it doesn't mean you've answered this question. And it's an important one. Who do you say that Jesus is? Because some of us, we go our whole lives and, and, and he's someone or something that we kind of add to our lives to kind of make our week go better, don't we? Maybe we'll go to church this week, start the week off right, maybe get some, you know, some goodness in my soul, some good teachings, some, some feel goods, whatever that is. But it's important for us to do business with that point. Who do you say that I, who do you say that I am? Not who does your wife say that I am? or your parents, or your family, or whoever brought you here, each one of us has to do business personally with Jesus and settle once and for all who he really is. Is he just a good teacher? Is he one of many options? Is he just someone that, you know, maybe offers some teaching, like I said, to make my marriage work or to make junior high work? Remember junior high? If you're in junior high, I'm sorry. Just want to wipe it out of the memory. Not junior hires. We love junior hires. Just the whole experience, the plague, the stuff. You know what I'm? You're not going there with me? Sorry, I forgot. West Side. I love you. I'm just messing with you. I'm glad you can laugh. It's important for you to decide. The way Peter did, Peter finally gets it and he speaks up. He's always a big mouth and he goes, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And that's a big deal because if he's wrong, what he's just said is heresy and can get him stoned. He's saying, I believe you're the one, you're divine, you're God. You're the one we've been waiting for. And friends, if Jesus really is the Christ, the son of the living God, then everything changes. Not just a little bit, not just when you're ready, not just when you get around to it, not just when you get your life in order, but if he's really the Christ, the son of the living God, that means there's going to be a radical shift, a radical revolution, a radical revival in your heart. So he says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And I love the response of Jesus. He says, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And this is where we get mixed up. Verse 18, it says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And a whole bunch of really bad St. Peter jokes were born. Because people, you know, because right after this, if you read the rest of the passage, you find out to commemorate this moment where Jesus reveals who he is to the disciples, he actually changes Peter's name, right? He actually, they start calling him the rock. But here's the mistake we make. Peter's not the rock. Peter's not the rock. I mean, if we look at the grammar, what he's saying on this rock, what rock? The rock that Jesus is the Christ. That's the rock. That's what the church is built on. And any church that's not built on the rock of Jesus Christ is not a Jesus church. So he says, on this rock, he's the rock. Other scriptures call Jesus the cornerstone, right? He's the cornerstone that people that couldn't accept that the Messiah would come from a peasant family in a little town like Buckley. (laughs) Ah, I got you, didn't I? Didn't see that coming. Didn't see that coming. Born in Bethlehem, raised in Galilee. They tripped over the cornerstone that was Jesus, the rock. He's the rock. But what I want to focus on, the first phrase is this. Now, I don't believe there's any wasted words in Scripture. I believe all of it is true. Every word. You don't get to cut and paste. You don't get to take what you like and leave out what you don't like because then you're forever trying to figure out what's true and what's not true. You either take all of it or none of it. And so he says... I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, 
I will build my church. I will build my church. He doesn't say, you guys are going to make churches and they're going to be all over northern Michigan someday. You're going to have multi-site campuses. You're going to have big ones. There's going to be small ones. And there's going to be, you know, all kinds of denominations. There's going to be free Methodist and locked up Methodist and Quakers and Bakers and <laughs> candlestick makers. There's going to be Catholics and Lutherans and everything. In no, 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 no. He said, I will build my church. I will do the building. Wow, what a humbling thing for us to think about. It's Christ that builds a church. It's Christ that built this church. Make no mistake about it. Jesus builds churches, and if he has to, he shuts churches down. But churches belong to Jesus. They're his church. He's in charge of the building. He's in charge of the people that come. He's in charge of the life change. He's in charge of not just building the size, but building the quality. He's the one that builds into us. It's always been about Jesus. It always will be about Jesus. The church is about Jesus, if it's a good church. And right here he says, I will build my church. My son called me out, and that's the worst when you get called out by your son. My wife and I have uh, five children, um, most of them planned. Um, there's a sermon in there. I won't go into it. It's probably not appropriate. But uh, we have four daughters, and then my son, he's the youngest, and he's 12, and he would rather uh, uh, die than make conversation, right? He just, he's surrounded by women. Pray for him. And uh, uh, I mean, sometimes he looks at me like, really, Dad, you brought me into this world? What? I just want to play Call of Duty and go somewhere, right? But um, sorry, now you think I'm a bad parent. But moving on. Um, uh, we, we were having a function at our, uh, our Buckley campus where we were kind of using the, the facility for an awards banquet for our soccer teams. And, and uh, it, was, it was this cool moment because, you know, even though it's a public school, they were coming into the walls and we had a big dinner and it was going to be cool and all this kind of stuff. And, and uh, uh, I made a huge mistake. Um, and the mistake was that I wanted to pray, but not that I wanted to pray because it's like, hey, if you're in the church and you're using this facility, we're going to pray before the food, right? It's just a little thing that Christians do. Uh, but all the players started running for the food, and I said, wait a second. I said, you're in my house. Get back here. We're going to pray for this food. And everyone's like, ha, 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 and they all kind of sat down. And my son, who's 12 years old on the junior high team, goes, this is not your church, Dad. It's God's house. Oh, snap, that happened. Humbled, wicked, cut my tongue out. And we make mistakes sometimes like that. We're like, oh, my church. It's really his church. He said he will build his church. And by God's grace, he's built this place. What a beautiful place. What a beautiful people. This is his church. He built it. He owns it. He owns it. He said, I'll build my church, and, and, and there's more encouragement, but as, as long, I mean, what goes along with I'll build my church is there's a promise. He says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Better men than the world leaders that lead us now, <laughs> I'm talking all nations, have tried to stomp out the church. 2,000 years they've been trying to eradicate the church. There have been world wars, there have been cold wars. There's been communism, Nazism, fascism, every kind of ism. Guess what's still here, church? You can try to prevail against the church, but you won't. And sometimes the church shines, and sometimes the church is the worst. But it's his church. Sometimes the church builds people up. Sometimes people are disappointed by church. My church. I mean his church, but the one I'm at. <laughs> we do that, right? But it's his church, and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. Do your worst. It's his church, and it will prevail to the end, right? Do you believe that? If it's built on Christ, it will prevail. I think it was St. Augustine who... Uh, said about the church. 
Because there's always people that want to throw stones at church. If there's college students here, you know, if you're going off to college, uh, even if you go to Christian college, they're going to throw stones at church. Because everybody's got a better idea how to run church. Right? I never wanted to be a preacher. Ever. My dad was a preacher. I didn't want to be a preacher. Are you filling in the blanks yet? You connecting the dots of my therapy? (laughs) And... For 30 years of my life, I went to church, and I loved Jesus, but I was always like, that church, you know, if they just did that, they would be better. You know, if that church, you know, I kind of liked that, but I wasn't being fed. Uh, If I went there, yeah, the music's too many organs, that one's uh, too many, it was just like, yeah, I had all these things about his church, and I was the best critic because I was born and raised in the church, right? And then when I'm 35 years old, God's like, here, you run one. Right? That's, yeah, it's a little bit frightening. That's a little bit frightening. It was St. Augustine who said, the church, she is a whore, but she is my mother. She is my mother. I'm grateful for the church. We don't always get it right. We don't always get it right. But Christ is the head. We are his body. On him, the church is built. He is the cornerstone. And he's the one who builds. He's the one who builds. Then he said one other thing, and I want to dial in on that on verse 19 and the time we have left. After he says, I'll build my church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I'll give you the keys. And I found myself meditating on that. Jesus said, I will give you the keys. It's his church. It's built on him, but he gives us the keys. Isn't that interesting? He gives us the keys. What do you do with keys? I brought some keys. Most of us don't carry keys. Now we have fobs. How weird is that? You guys got a fob? You know what I'm talking about? Don't look at me like I'm stupid. Come on. (laughs) But back in the day when you needed keys to drive a car, they looked like this, kids, right? And what you could do with keys is you could... You can lock a door with keys, or you can unlock doors with keys. That's what you do with keys. Duh, right? That's what you do. Well, Jesus said, and if there's no wasted words in Scripture, I will build my church. But guess what? I'm going to give you the keys. I'll give you the keys. So there's a certain amount of responsibility that comes with keys. You can either lock doors, or you can open doors. You can lock the doors of the church. You can open the doors of the church. You can lock doors of the kingdom. You can open doors of the kingdom. Well, what does that mean? Well, if we start fleshing that out a little bit, well, we'll start with this. When I was 16 years old, living in Plymouth, Indiana, I'm a high school junior, I don't know, sophomore, I can't remember. And I remember when my father gave me the keys to the family car, the hand-me-down one, he got the better one, of course. But I'm driving the family truckster, the Clark Griswold mobile. The Chevy Impala station wagon, two-tone blue. When he gave me the keys, I went to a little store in the mall, and I bought a little switch and stuck it on the dashboard. It said, front machine gun. I'm a dork, sorry. But like in the first week or so of giving me the keys to the car, it wasn't that great. I I, I had three crashes, like in a month. That's not good for the insurance, people, right? In fact, in one day, I'm not proud of this, with the keys to the car, I was a little bit irresponsible. I I smashed into one car uh, on the way to school in a parking lot, and on the way home, I hit a school bus. (laughs) It was icy. Calm down. I was raised in Haiti. I don't know about this ice, right? Bro, you know what happened when they uh, taunted a prophet in the Old Testament? Watch out for bears. (laughs) You know what the mascot of Buckley is? (laughs) Bears, bro. (laughs) So the keys, if he gives us the keys, the kingdom, if he gives us the keys of the church, what are we going to do? How do we unlock the doors? I don't want to lock the doors of the church. There's people all over northern Michigan. There's plenty for all of us to go after. There's plenty of people that are far from God that need Jesus. There's plenty of people that aren't in any church, that don't have a personal relationship with Christ. They haven't come to that conclusion of, who do you say that I am? You're the Christ. They haven't said that yet. And many of them, in my belief, feel locked out. 
Sometimes we lock people out of the church and we don't even realize we're locking them out. We lock them out of the church by the decisions we make about how we're going to run church or where we're going to put church or what it's going to be like. Do you know the number one thing that people say to me when they try out our church for the very first time and they've never been in church before is within five minutes of the conversation, they're looking around and they're like, oh man, I thought this whole place would set on fire. I thought the walls would just fall down because here I am, the worst sinner ever. Well, where do they get that impression from? From us. They get it from us. Some of it's the conviction of their heart, and some of it is, you know, that they should know better. They've been running from God for a while, but many times it's from us. The things we do, the things we say, the way we program, we don't even realize that we're locking the doors to the church. So I would just say, West Side, start thinking, even as we finish here today, what are some ways we could unlock the doors of the kingdom? What are some ways that we could unlock the doors of the church or lock the doors? By all means, lock the doors. Is that why he gave us the keys? Do you think it's God's plan to lock the doors of the kingdom and leave sinners outside? To lock the doors of the kingdom and leave hurting people outside? To lock the doors of the church and leave lost people far from God? Do you really think that's his plan? So how do we unlock the doors? How do we unlock the doors? Remember a couple years ago, someone in, uh, at our Buckley campus decided to donate, I don't know, five, $6,000, whatever it was, and it was for a specific thing. And usually we don't do that. We don't let people donate to things. But this time we did because this person wanted to build a gazebo outside that had ashtrays and heaters so the smokers would have a place to go before, after, and between the services. Does that hurt your feelings? I'll never forget a board member stomping up to me when he saw it going up, and he goes, are we encouraging this now? I said, bro, do you want him to flick the butts on the ground, or do you want to put him in an ashtray? Well, an ashtray would be better. Well, there you go. Unlock the doors. And it was a bigger conversation, and I'm not saying you have to have ashtrays, and I'm not saying that, hey, kids, don't smoke, stay in school. All that's, I'm not saying that. But I know this, in 2019, many times as a smoker, you can feel like certain doors are locked to you. You can be a terrorist living on the left coast and have more acceptance in the United States in 2019 than a smoker. You smoke, you're so disgusting. That's not what I think. That was called sarcasm. Little stupid things like smoking. Should smoking keep someone out of the kingdom? You can lock the doors, you can open the doors. What are you going to do with the way we program a service? Do people know how to, when to stand up, when to sit down, why we're standing up, why we're sitting down? By the way, you did a great job. I felt super comfortable. But what about personally? Do you unlock doors or lock the doors? You can choose to lock the doors by not giving. Or you can choose to unlock the doors by giving. You can choose to give conditionally. Well, we'll just see. We'll see how it goes. We'll see if I really like these people. You can choose to lock the doors by choosing not to serve. You know, I've done my time. Someone else can do that. You know what? I think all the young parents that have kids in the nursery, they should all have to do a shift in the nursery. I didn't bring any kids in this world. I care about the environment. (laughs) Why would you do that? You're locking the doors. Unlock the doors, man. The way we give, the way we serve, the way we act outside these walls. When we go outside these walls, some of us are going to go to dinner. And the service is going to be terrible. We're going to pray over our food, and then we're going to say, you know what? She didn't even look like she... Even, I think she forgot us. Well, she's not getting a great tip. Or you can say, you know what, that might be a single mom who saw us pray and the service is terrible, we're going to tip double. You might have just unlocked the doors because all of a sudden she associates people that pray over food as people who are generous. You see, I know that's dumb. But we can either lock the doors as a church or unlock the doors. And personally, we can choose to lock doors or unlock doors. What will you do? How will you live? We've got to decide what to do with Christ. And if he's really the son of the living God, if that's really who he is, 
He promises that he'll build his church. He'll do it. Don't worry about it. He's got it. But he's offered us the keys. And the way we live inside the church, the way we live outside the church, the way we invite people to be a part of his church, or don't, because it's not your personality. You just locked it, bro. You can be a student and unlock the doors of the kingdom. Sometimes they're the best at it because they drive a little reckless. And you could be as old as Noah and be someone who chooses to unlock. This is our responsibility. This is what he's called us to. Our Jesus, our Lord, our God, our King, our pastor, our great high priest. Would you bow your heads with me? What is God saying to you this morning? I don't know your situation. I don't know what you're going through. But God in his spirit does. So what is he saying? And what will you do about it? Lord Jesus, I pray that your word would cut straight to the heart of the most important issue in our lives right now. And that your spirit would challenge us and change us for your glory and our joy. It's in Jesus' name we pray, the one who owns this church And every church that calls him Lord. It's in his name we pray. And if you agree, church, say amen.
sing. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. Thank you, John, for speaking this morning. We will see you guys. Yes, indeed. Be blessed in Jesus' name. We'll see you next week.